Hi guys, Brian from Brian Boas here. Several of you guys recently asked me how I decide which snakes to pair up for breeding. So today I thought I'd go through the criteria that I consider when I'm deciding which snakes to pair up. I'm also going to show you some of my most anticipated breeding pairs for 2021. If you're new to the channel, this is the place for information about all aspects of keeping and breeding boa constrictors in captivity. So if you want to learn more about these amazing animals, be sure to subscribe right now. So this first animal is uh, from a really highly anticipated pairing. This is a male Suriname red tail boa that was born here, sired by my famous male Prometheus. And so this will be the first second generation breeding from the Prometheus bloodline. So I'm really excited about that. This guy is a, a 2016 a male. Unfortunately, he's in shed right now, so he's a little bit dull. But I actually did a series of four videos on all of my planned pairings for 2021. So be sure to check that out if you really want to see my full 2021 lineup. So how do I select which boas to pair up? The first consideration is that they have to be ready to breed. And by ready to breed, I mean mature enough to breed. And there's really three main considerations I use to determine if a boa is mature enough to breed, its age, its size, and its body shape. So the first age is pretty straightforward. In general, for locality boas, the females will be at least five years old before they're ready to breed, the males at least four years old. For morph boas, I would say about a year or so younger, so the females should be about four, males about three. And I haven't bred any of my morph boas yet because I got into the morphs a lot later and my oldest females in the morphs are only three years old. But based on their current body size and condition, I would estimate that they would be ready to breed for the 2022 uh, breeding season, which would make them to be four years old. I've heard about morphers breeding even younger, you know, three-year-old females, two-year-old males. But as far as my own um, thoughts for me I would probably wait about a year or so older. The second factor that can tell me if a boa is mature enough to breed is its size. And in general for most of the larger boas like the true red tails and Argentine boas things like that the smallest size of a female for breeding should be at least five to six feet long for a male somewhere around four to five feet long. And there are exceptions. Sometimes you have a smaller bloodline of true red tails and they might be a little bit smaller. But um, for the dwarf and the semi-dwarf boas, for the females, they should probably be about four feet or so long. Males, at least three, three and a half feet. And you might think, well, these are really small sizes because of course people think boa constrictors are these huge snakes, which of course they're not. But um, in general, if you slow grow your boas and you feed them the right way, you don't power feed them, it's gonna take you four to five years to get to these sizes. So this is, this is a four year old male. This guy is about four and a half, maybe five feet long. And this is the smallest size and age of a male that I would consider breeding. And so now what about power feeding? We've all heard these stories about people that have fed a boa so it gets to be like eight feet long in three years and then they try to breed it earlier. But this is a really bad idea because this boa is going to be morbidly obese and it's going to have all kinds of extra body fat and really be in very bad shape for breeding. Which takes us to the third criterion for determining if a boa is mature enough to breed and that's the body shape. But first I want to show you the other half of this really anticipated Suriname pairing. This is the female that I'm going to pair that male with. This is a 2014 holdback female born here. Unfortunately, she's also in shed just like the male. But this is a female from my other bloodline of Suriname, my other main bloodline that I'm working with. And I've been planning for many years to cross these two bloodlines. I think that these are going to be some truly exceptional Suriname red tails if I get some babies. But this female illustrates the body shape. So once, uh, when a boa gets to be around four years old, especially the true red tails, they get much more muscular. So the body takes on a very square muscular shape. You can just feel the power of the muscles in these animals. Um, they're not round and fatty. They're very you know, slim and trim and muscular. You don't want a boa to be underweight, obviously. You know, for a female to carry a litter, she's gotta have some 
you know, reserves on her because she's not going to eat very much for, you know, six months or so. Um, but you don't obviously want them to be obese or fat because fatty boas have a very difficult time delivering um, offspring and they frequently have issues with retained offspring, retained slugs, things like that. Also, fatty boas in general are less fertile, both the males and the females. So if you have an obese boa, he's not going to be, the male is not going to be able to fertilize the female really well. And the female is going to be less likely to get gravid and have more issues with, you know, giving birth to the offspring. So you, you want an animal that's, that's muscular and trim uh, without being fatty. And so the last things I consider when determining if an individual animal is ready to breed is it has to be in optimal health with no health issues or it's not you know recovering from any kind of illness or anything like that. And also for females, I only breed them every other year. So if a female has bred the previous year, I'm going to give her a year off just so she can recover and put on more weight. Males generally can breed every year. But sometimes you might want to give a male a year off every once in a while. The males might breed well for you know three or four years in a row, but then they might kind of get burned out and you might notice that your fertility in your litters is going down, you're having more slugs. So that might be a sign that you want to give your male a year off just to recover. Here's one half of another highly anticipated pairing I have for 2021. This is my male Tomatama Venezuela true red tail boa. So this is a rare locality of true red tail boa from a small village in southern Venezuela. There's not too many of these in captivity. I actually attempted to breed them in 2020. I paired them up and it looked like there was some breeding activity. Unfortunately, my female did not become gravid, but I'm going to try again, fingers crossed, in 2021 for some of these rare Venezuelan red tail boas. We've determined that we have animals which are in shape to breed, but now the second question is how do I select which male is going to be paired up with which female? Well, the first consideration is the animals have to be from the same locality for a locality breeding project. For example, with a Venezuelan red tail, I would never pair it up with a Suriname or a Peruvian red tail, only with another Venezuelan red tail. One of the main foundations of locality boa breeding is that we keep localities pure and we don't cross them with other localities. But I've also heard people that want to keep bloodlines pure. For example, if they have Suriname red tails that are from Fudo, Bob Fudo's bloodlines, they don't want to cross them from animals with animals from another breeder, for example, like a Miller bloodline. But I think that this is a little misguided. And in general, I like to cross different bloodlines of the same locality. Because if you're just breeding the same bloodlines with each other, you're going to have inbreeding. Inbreeding in boas is a controversial topic, and I actually did a video on this you might want to check out for more discussion about inbreeding. But in general, I try to outcross whenever possible with another animal of the same locality. Also, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding out there about what does and doesn't constitute a bloodline. And I intend to explore some of these issues in an upcoming video, but people will often associate a bloodline with a breeder, such as the Bob Fudo bloodline of Suriname boas. But really, most breeders are working with multiple bloodlines, so you can't just say this, this is a Fudo bloodline. I mean, what does that really even mean? And then the aspect of you're basically crossing it with other boas, at what point does it not no longer become a bat bloodline? And I'm going to talk about this in a future video. But back to the inbreeding. Um, inbreeding may not be quite as bad in boas as it is in some other species. And, you know, in some cases I have bred full siblings to each other. Um, and I have had absolutely no issues. So there's a concept called line breeding where you breed related animals to, to select for certain traits. And typically the difference between line breeding and inbreeding is line breeding doesn't result in any negative consequences, whereas inbreeding does. So although I have had absolutely no issues with inbreeding for one generation, I probably wouldn't do it for more than that. And I recommend that you introduce fresh, unrelated bloodlines into your projects at least every few generations. Unfortunately, with some of the locality boas, there's so few bloodlines available 
that were have no choice but to inbreed. But that's the subject that I covered in my video on inbreeding. Here we have the other half of the Tomatoma Venezuela true red tail pairing. This is the female, and as you can see, the Tomatoma Venezuela true red tails are a smaller form of true red tail. This female is about six years old, and she's maybe five and a half feet long or so. Um, they are kind of unique in that they kind of have the coloration of the Peruvian, kind of the yellowish golden color, but the shape of the head is much shorter, almost similar to a Colombian boa imperator. So they're this really cool boa that has characteristics of some of the other types. I really like the boas from Venezuela, and I'm excited next year to have both this pairing and also the Paraguanera Venezuela true red tail, or it's not a true red tail, the Paraguanera Peninsula boa, which I'll show you in a few minutes. The next consideration is how do I decide which specific male goes with which specific female? Let's say I have a number of different Suriname males and Suriname females that are all ready to go. How do I choose who goes with who? When I'm selecting the specific pairings, I look for males and females that are going to complement each other well. And basically I look for three different traits, the color, the contrast, and the pattern and sat saddle shape. And I don't necessarily pair up animals that look similar. Sometimes I like to pair up animals of a given locality that look a little bit different. Because I found when the mother and father look a little bit different, sometimes the best physical characteristics of both parent combine in the offspring. And then sometimes you get kind of different looks, so to speak, where the physical characteristics are kind of rearranged in different combinations. And you get this variety of cool looking offspring from which you can select the next generation you're going to hold back. For example, sometimes I've had animals that have had kind of moderately peaked saddles and I've crossed them together and I've got an offspring that have the whole gamut of saddle shape. Some, you know, some of them have round saddles, some of them have moderately peaked saddles, some of them have really nice, uh, you know, uh, exaggerated peak saddles. So you get kind of a little bit of everything. So you don't necessarily want to pair up animals that look very similar to each other if you have the choice. And that's another reason why you might not want to cross two animals from the same bloodline. Another thing to consider when selecting the breeding pairs is if I have a male that's been proven and has bred successfully in the past, especially with the true red tails, this might be a reason to select him. And then the size of the animals. Typically, you don't want males that are going to be bigger than the females. So it's, it's fine to pair a small male with a bigger female. And it's okay to pair animals that are of similar size. But in general, you don't want a big male with a smaller female. That doesn't usually work out as well. One more of my highly anticipated boa pairs for 2021 is my Peregrinera Peninsula boas from Venezuela. This is the male. This guy is now six years old and he's maybe four feet long. This is a dwarf form of boa from a peninsula in northwestern Venezuela. Pretty rare in captivity. Really cool look. They have a lot of characteristics intermediate between Boa Imperator and the true red tail boas, although technically they're classified as a Boa Imperator. And I haven't tried to breed these guys before, so fingers crossed for a litter in 2021. Another thing that I consider when determining which animals to pair up is my own bandwidth. As you may know, I'm a one-man operation and with my snakes, filming these videos, my day job, my family, and all my other responsibilities, there's only a limited number of, of hours in the day that I can be spending breeding boas. So in general, I can probably handle about 15 or so pairings, and that's actually what I have planned for next year. There were a number of potential pairings that I decided to hold off on till the following year. It takes time to do these pairings. You have to put the animals together, observe them, monitor them, and then you have to separate them at certain times to feed them and then put them together. And the pairings go on for typically between four and six months. So there's a lot of time spent in doing this. Right now, as I mentioned, about 15 pairings is what I can handle. Maybe in the future, as my kids get older, 
they'll be able to chip in and help me and then I can handle more pairings. The bandwidth considerations also apply to the care of the babies. Right now I have space and facilities to handle about a hundred or so babies. If I needed to handle a few more, I could build some more racks, but there's a limit to how many babies I can house and establish and get ready to go, as well as not to mention rehoming them and shipping them off. So as I've said before, I'm a small operation. I'm not a snake factory, and I don't see that changing in the future. I focus on quality here, not quantity, and I'm not gonna be at a point where I can, you know, for example, have thousands of babies a year. It's just not gonna happen. And so I consider this, I don't want to set up too many pairings because I might not have the bandwidth to care for and house the babies properly. This is the last boa for today's video. This is my female Paraguanera Peninsula boa from Venezuela. You can see she's about the same size as the male, maybe four, four and a half feet, another six year old animal. And these are a dwarf form of boa. Um, really cool boa. I really would be thrilled if I could get some babies next year. So we'll have to see what happens. And if you want to check out the rest of my lineup for 2021, again, I did a series of four videos on my 2021 breeding pairs. So you, want, you might want to check out those videos. The last thing to consider when you're thinking about whether you should pair up two boas is the market demand. You don't want to produce litters of boas that aren't in demand and that you're not going to be able to find homes for because then you're going to be stuck caring for lots of baby boas for a very long time. So fortunately, locality boas are in pretty high demand now and almost all locality boas are selling out really fast. However, if you're working with a less desirable boa, such as a mixed ancestry common boa or some of the more common morphs like albinos, you really want to understand the market demand before you think about pairing up two boas. One of the reasons why it would be a terrible idea to cross two different locality boas is because there would be very little, if any, demand for the offspring. You'd have a mixed ancestry boa and no locality boa collector is going to want this animal in their collection. The animal's only going to be worthwhile as a pet and not as a future breeder. Once you cross two lo different locality boas together, you can never regenerate the pure locality from the offspring. So please be really careful when you're considering which of your boas are going to be compatible to pair up together. I hope this video was helpful. As always, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to shoot me a line. Thanks for watching and enjoy your boas.